Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode 51 of the 9 to 5 Fitness Podcast. I am Anabolic Gabe and uh, we've got Louis Phillips 12. Uh, yeah, what's going on, mate? Just got back from kicking a 50 meter goal. A few yeah. of them, Ashley. Yeah, not bad. Big footy bloke here. Um, Louis is actually away for two weeks. So we've got big Matty Crundle. He is an elite power lifter. One of the, um, he's got some freakish lifts. So we'll get into how strong he is, how he's boosted up his lifts and how you can do the same as well. But Matt, how did you sleep? Bit rough last night. Had a uh, a bit too much pre workout before bed. Had to dose up the melatonin to not off. But yeah, got here safely. Mel- um, yeah, melatonin, mate. Bit of a, a sleep hack, isn't it? Do you reckon you yeah, just like bit. you fall asleep straight away when you have those? Oh yeah, hundred percent. Just forget you even took it. And what kind of milligrams are we talking? You're a big boy. Uh, at least ten. At least ten. Sometimes fifteen. Jeez. I'm not even joking, yeah. Isn't the prescription ones like two milligrams each? Yeah, like, but they do shit all pretty much. It's not yeah. doing anything. So Matt is an elite level powerlifter, guys. His bench press is like 200 kilos. It is absolutely crazy. So one of the things we will be talking about in this podcast is how like the ultimate bench press guide. So how you can get an elite bench press as well. Like we know a bunch of you guys will be 60 kilograms, 16 year olds with probably 50, 60 kilo benches. And we'll be ch- chatting to you guys about how we can really attack that bench press comprehensively and do everything you can to boost that weight up we're talking you know hitting 100 kilos soon getting up to three plates just really get into elite level territory but first of all matt we're going to give you a little bit of an introduction because some people might not know you may have heard of you you're from melbourne you're 22 what else do you do yeah so i'm um, 22 from melbourne powerlifter i'm also a coach uh, i coach out of training day uh, for the in-person uh, clients, so more general population, but I also run uh, online coaching for uh, a big bunch of powerlifters. Uh, this year should be a big year in powerlifting for them myself. Uh, before powerlifting, I did gymnastics actually for 10 years, so from the age of five to about 14 to 15. Um, and then that took up a lot of my uh, just physical time, and it was a pretty hard sport. So naturally to get into uh, like powerlifting or before that i just started going to the gym at about 15 years old um, just as an outlet because i got so much energy i've never not done competitive sport um, started gymming about 15 to 16 years old blew up pretty fast as if you if you really get into it and you get into a rhythm of eating more than you're used to training hard you will blow up uh, pretty quickly which we'll talk about soon um did that for a couple of years then found out what powerlifting is just on youtube etc uh, and then that's kind of where it started yeah now powerlifting or gymnastics to powerlifting it's a pretty unique transition at least i think are there many gymnasts that kind of went down that route um i didn't train with many gymnasts that started uh, went on to lift weights um, but what it does give you is a really good base in uh, just general control and proprioception so your awareness and how to use your muscles especially your upper body which is why mm. which might have played a big part in having a big bench press or like a just a solid rig upper body legs not so much you don't you don't do heaps but um good good foundation good sport um getting into lifting definitely wasn't hindered uh, by doing gymnastics definitely benefited from it quite a lot and you also you always see those male gymnasts with absolutely jacked biceps like serious just like Matt's, Matt's flexing his biceps for those of you that are listening on Spotify. Um, but they have these absolutely jacked like... Yeah, baseballs. Yeah, baseball biceps. It's crazy. Like literally six packs, eight packs. Like some of the most impressive physiques you've seen, like those hardcore Russian gymnasts on that special yep. Turkesterone juice. <laughs> um, like they're, they're freaky. And for those of you who has who haven't seen Matt's bench press, it is a sight to behold. Like it is scary. He's, Appreciate that. He's got a... You've got... Would you say your technique is almost unusual because of how flexible you are compared to the normal powerlifter? Yeah, the flexibility and, and again, proprioception of ability to control your back is, is pretty enhanced in gymnastics. So I'm a pretty big guy. I'm like just shy of 100 kilos, but I can probably arch more than like the average girl um, just because of all those years of practice and just mobility. Um, mm-hmm. Couple that with being really muscular and you've, yeah, pretty big bench press as a result. Uh- but now this word proprioception that you keep mentioning, what does that actually mean? So basically just means your ability to control uh, your body uh, uh, pretty precisely and also the awareness of where it is and how it's moving in respect to 
what you're doing uh, regarding physical activity. Okay, fantastic. And I suppose that is absolutely pivotal to powerlifting since it is kind of the pinnacle of biomechanics and efficient moving and exerting force. So you need to know what your body's doing. Yeah, exactly. Powerlifting, pretty simple sport. You've just got three lifts. However, in that simplicity comes a lot of, uh, you know, complex sort of aspects. So maximizing your efficiency on all, all the three lifts as the years go on is a really big staple of getting lifts up. Now, I know for me, I, the way I got into powerlifting, so I was fresh out of school. I was 18 and a few months years old. Louis and I started training in the gym. You guys have probably heard this story a million times. And I was kind of stronger than all of my mates already. And, you know, I was getting stronger, getting stronger, probably stronger than all of the people in my local gym already. Mm. And I'm like, there has to be more. Give me something more. <laughs> and so I was just like, you know, there's this thing called powerlifting, which kind of, you know, all your mates want to see who can bench press the most, who can yeah. squat the most, who can deadlift the most. But once you kind of outgrow all your mates, you're like, what's the next competition here? So then... I kind of found out about powerlifting or I'd see people on Instagram posting these lifts, but I didn't know how to get into it in Australia or in Melbourne because it seemed so kind of underground. And I was like, oh, do you have to know someone? I know a secret password to get into powerlifting. <laughs> uh, that's at least, that's genuinely what I thought until um, my physio actually is a really well-respected physio, really switched on, just like knows the science so well. So I respect his opinion extremely highly. And I was like, mate, do you know any good powerlifting coaches he's like i know i don't respect many people's opinions but i respect this guy's opinions and he gave me uh josh's contact details yep. ever since then i've been working with josh um and josh has got me into powerlifting from there and so he introduced me to the people the gyms the competitions everything like that so it's kind of like once you exceed the local gym you want to find you want to compete and stuff like that is mm. that kind of a similar route that you took yeah very similar in terms of you know like gabe you're at a commercial gym might not be that big the people there might not be honing into strength as much. If you have uh, at least moderate discipline, you've got decent genetics, you'll find that you quickly outgrow that sort of setting. So you go explore the internet. Oh, that's at least what I did. Found videos online of, you know, like Airy Lillybridge, Pete Rubish, Larry Wheels and stuff back yeah. a few years ago before they started chasing clout, at least Larry. Um, and then... And then, yeah, you just kind of find out, okay, this is a sport I can actually excel in. Like you said, um, squat, bench, and deadlift, that's like benchmarks of strength I want to chase. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and I just kind of Googled a bit as to, you know, clubs that hosted powerlifting and coaches. Back in 2017, when I started competing in powerlifting, a bit before it blew up uh, into the scene a bit more, um, there weren't many clubs. So what I actually started was at Melbourne Uni, they've got this um, elite squad that used to train there at least coached by the old uh rob wilkes or at least he did uh and that's when i that's where i started so i uh, researched online found the federation which is powerlifting australia subsequently went into have an assessment there jumped straight into the squad and then snowballed um into powerlifting but you can obviously like yourself uh be referred in any sort of which way you just if someone knows the scene and introduces to it that's as as easy to get in now you say you had an assessment what did that assessment consist of pretty much just rolled up hadn't trained in like a month due to a bit of injury uh and just he got me to do like a five rm on all three lifts totally yeah. unprepared and i was 17 at the time and he thought that was good enough he just took me in and signed up for a comp within the first couple of weeks now i know this would be far from your best but what kind of what were your five rms back then so when i was about 17 um i could probably uh, in terms of i'm not sure what the five rms was but um before i turned 18 i was benching about 160 kilos i was squatting about 220 to 230 and could deadlift a, the ballpark at 240 yeah, so and that's pretty with much me. better than me <laughs> no, <I'm> 23 <laughs> well that was with i think about a couple years training mm -hmm. under my belt so i blew up pretty fast i started at like 70 kilos body weight yeah um 2015 and then by 2017 i was already up to the mid 90s but a lot of that was just kind of like just absorbing gains as yeah, yeah. as we spoke before you jump in a gym you will quickly realize you'll just blow up in that first one to two year period that is some mental progress um so the you talk about Melbourne Uni. Did you go to Melbourne Uni to be in that club? Or was it just no, the university? No, I was actually still in high school uh, yeah. when I joined that club. And that, that's not exclusive to the students, so long as you are strong enough to get in. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, that's that. And then since then, 2018 onwards, I've just... I left there, um, found Training Day, uh, which is where I work now, in uh, mid-2018. And since then, I've just been self-coach. And that also ties into the, the athletes I coach and stuff like that. Yeah, awesome. So um, that's a really awesome introduction there and fantastic 
to see kind of your pathway into powerlifting. And I think that'll give, like, I get a lot of messages on Instagram of people. I can't respond to all the messages, but people being like, Gabe, how do I get into powerlifting? But there's like, it's kind of self, you have to be self-directed and I feel mm. like you can't have someone holding your hand and going like, this is how you do it. You just have to search for the exactly. answers. Exactly. Just everyone's got a phone. Everyone's got the internet. Just Google powerlifting, Australian powerlifting. You'll find uh, rabbit holes every which way and they'll all probably lead in like a similar direction of drug tested powerlifting. There's not really, there's only one real fed now, a Australian powerlifting union that does that. And it's, yeah, it's pretty easy to stumble across. Yeah, fantastic. So we might get into, hang on, I'll just adjust that. That should be good. Uh, so like the main guide of how to boost your lifts and your strength. And, you know, there's probably a lot of weak fellas listening to this and they're like, Gabe, Matt, I want to, obviously Matt's quite a lot stronger than I am, but I'm stronger than your average gym goer. How do we get up to your level? How do we actually make some progress? You know, I want to be stronger than all my mates. I want to, you know, maybe if I can bench a hundred kilos, that girl that I really like will finally kiss me or something <laughs> like that, you know? So we're here to help you. This is you know, not gender specific. I think the same principles apply to each gender um, in terms of like actual strength fundamentals. Is that, would you agree with that? Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. The, the tenets of strength are going to be the same. And then the minutia kind of um, goes every which yeah. way, the more uh, complex you get, but yeah, the main principles are the same. Exactly. So we will be speaking about kind of how to progress in the main lifts here, but I think those principles kind of apply for a range of different lifts as well. So obviously your big three, your squat, bench and deadlift. And then other ones could probably be like your overhead press. What other kind of clout lifts are there? Uh, yeah, squat bench dead, overhead press. Uh, lo- a lot of people love doing uh, bent over rows and just kind of mm. cheating it all over their chest. Um, but yeah, compounds, focus on them. Um, and then throw in plenty of, uh, as we are talking about before, weighted chin-ups and uh, yeah. dips, stuff like that. Body, just Don't be afraid to use your body weight. And then if you're strong with your body weight, go ahead and put a weight belt on. Very, very underrated to do that, yeah. There's, I suppose there's hip thrust as well. Some people chase cloud on that. The, <laughs> the one I really can't get around is people who brag about their leg press. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I remember doing that uh, for about a year and then I realized how uh, irrelevant that was when you actually start barbell squatting and start barbell squatting yep. low to the ground. It's totally just... It makes it obsolete to do uh, talk about your leg press, yeah. I'm trying to think if there's any other cool cool clout lifts out there or cringy lifts. You know, cringe. I think that there's a, <laughs> the real clout lift is the, the glizzy crusher or the, the hip adduction. Um, the sus machine. Yeah, the sus machine. <laughs> you know, I can almost max out the sus machine. I, I'm pretty oh, yeah. impressed by that. You know, I've got some strong Sorry. adductors here. Meet there. Um, yeah, what other lifts would there be? Like, uh, obviously, like, there's dumbbell presses. But oh, yeah. Half squat, uh, half reps, half squats. Yeah. I reckon, uh, yeah, the amount of, uh, like, this isn't, um, you know, shitting on anyone because when I first started, I didn't know what depth was and I yeah. squatted only to what I felt comfortable, Same. which is about halfway down at the most and which is probably what everyone else does. Uh, I'd say that's a pretty, uh, it's funny in retrospect, but not in the moment when you think you're like a hero and like a champion, uh, but it's funny in retrospect when you can squat a blade down probably squat way more then you look back in the past oh crap i wasn't even squatting halfway with half the weight yeah. mate i remember i first started training legs in 2019 and <laughs> i would load it up to 160 kilos uh, i was training with louis at the time um yeah. in this uh, this gym called bentley fitness center um and one day he recorded me and i thought i was the sickest bloke you know look how much weight i'm doing show off in front of any, everyone i started off using a cushion as well um yeah it was a good sight you know i'd take the shoes off squatting in socks my legs were probably one third of the size of what they were um rightly so and he takes a video of me i'm pretty sure i've still got the video like it was genuinely like a 30 degree squat <laughs> and going back up it's a terminal knee extension and i was like <laughs> <laughs> it was embarrassing but i think we all have to kind of start yep. there everyone starts it every yep. sort of which way if you haven't got guidance probably takes slightly longer to get back in the, into the flow of what real lifting is but yeah, everyone starts somewhere you have to be uh, shamed or like feel bad about starting with a certain lift or certain technique so everyone everyone starts somewhere now we wrote down a bunch of points here for how to boost your lifts and boost your strength and i think we kind of need to add one into there. And that the first one is make sure your technique is on point first. Oh yeah, 100%. Because if you're just ego lifting and stuff like that, you're going to injure yourself. And like you you might be progressing in a lift, but if you're, the technique isn't down pat, you'll be progressing in a lift, which isn't actually the correct lift. I don't know. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So I guess we'll, we'll just run through like the, the core principles of like how to keep your lifts going. Uh, again, 
as I said earlier, like when you just start out, you've got all this momentum behind you. Body's not um, adapted to any sort of uh, mechanism of stimulation for getting bigger muscles or getting stronger. So all these will be pretty fast initially. So um, what I'd say first of all is try your best to research uh, into um, sound, you know, template programs. See the one with the most and and uh, highest average reviews. Um, or uh, seek out some sort of coaching from someone who's reputable, done it for a few years and produced actual results with that, that you desire. Um, if you're not gonna go down that route immediately of finding a program or a coach, just be like reasonable and smart about your lifting. So that includes no ego lifting. So don't try to, which goes hand in hand with technique, don't try to do something that you can barely stabilize, barely take a bar out of the rack or unrack from a squat. If it's gonna be, if it's already crushing your body and it's already like kind of making you wobbly, probably don't um, dabble in those sort of weights just yet. Focus on technique, full range of motion for all three lifts. Um, and then we'll talk about technique later, but yeah, good technique, full range of motion. I think, yeah, that structured programming and just having like training blocks that kind of progress and you know, they're well periodized, everything's organized really nicely. You kind of forget how much progress you can make through that, at least I did. Yep. Cause you know, I was training through comps and, you know, I had a quick turnaround from the local qualified and nationals and I was trying to get super strong really quickly, which is obviously you mm. can't really do it. You can only make so much progress. Mm. And I was still on these consistent training blocks by the same coach and I was slowly progressing and I'd actually dropped five kilos, mm. um, gone through some rough circumstances, but my strength kept going up and I was like, why am I getting so strong? Mm. Um, and it's just through that consistent program because there's those neurological adaptions that, um, occur to your body and it's just like it is just like you might i'm not getting any more muscular but my body's just adapting to better mm, technique and 100%. being able to you know exert more force and things like that so like that structured programming and just staying consistent on it and slowly adding it in and having your deloads and everything like that it puts you in the right trajectory and 100 percent you'll make progress yep game changer like 100 percent on the ball there so Structured programming can be anything from really complex periodized program like you're talking about blocks of training that are structured by mm-hmm. coach. Um, that's probably the highest tier you can go. But if, again, if you don't want to dabble in that just yet, um, recording or having a, a rough idea of the trajectory of your weights, making sure that you leave maybe a couple reps in the tank every set. Don't go to failure every session. Um, aim to keep adding weight slowly. And then when you get to that kind of brink point where you are going to plateau or you feel burnt out, don't be afraid, as you said, take a DLO week, reduce a bit of the volume and, and stress and weight, and then ramp back up slowly and just try to push the boundaries whilst going back and forth in between yeah. a DLO and pushing. I remember my first year and a half of training, I was just doing a bro split and smashing volume. Like <clears> I think for chest, I would do like a dedicated chest that would usually be on a Wednesday and I would smash like 10 exercises each for three to four sets. I'd do uh, flat bench, incline bench, decline bench, pec flies, dumbbell flies, pec flies with dumbbells. Um, you know, the ones with the, I do everything <laughs> like that. Don't get me wrong. Like I got good chest Swimmer. genetics and my chest was fucking huge. Like it was massive. But then I went away on exchange and, uh, me and my mates picked up the Jeff Nippard like oh, yeah. uh, intermediate uh, upper lower split. Yeah, it was like program. strength and size. Yeah. It was nine weeks. I made so much progress for that because it was actually um, pretty well scientifically optimized and it exposed you to way more efficient frequencies for each week and it mm. was actually progressing you. It had prescribed weights or like RPEs and percentages of one rep maxes and my lifts just absolutely skyrocketed through that. And I think that's kind of what we offer through nine to five is um, programs that offer similar kind of principles and will progress you into that direction. So like I remember through those nine weeks, I just made an insane amount of progress because I wasn't actually training in an optimized way before that. Mm. But from there, it was incredible. Yeah, I think you touch on a really good point, which is not um, just related to getting on a good program, but prior to getting on a program, like we both used to in the past, um, a typical person probably does way too much uh, volume and just work in general in the gym that is beyond um, like an effective sort of range that you need to do and then it will just make you tired and fatigue. So um, as a general guide, if you're training maybe like four to five times a week and you're just starting out, um, what you want to do is pick maybe two to three exercises per muscle group on whatever sort of day you're training and only do maybe three to four sets tops for those exercises. But what you want to do is push them uh, and make them high quality sets. So range mm-hmm. of motion, 
uh, full range of motion and then get them somewhere close to failure, but not totally there. And you'd be surprised how little sets you can do through a workout that fit that criteria of high quality, so hard, but full range of motion. You're going to make way more progress. You're going to be way less fatigued. Yep. And as you found out, you can do less work, um, but actually make more gains because you haven't got this huge debt of recovery to fill and you're not doing all this junk kind of volume and work. So yeah, a big tenet is pull back, make the most out of how minimal you can train versus just throwing um, extra volume and, and meaningless exercises in your program for starters. Yeah, a hundred percent. And that's, I remember some people who probably haven't been exposed to that side of things, they'd buy my program and they'd have great reviews about it, but they'd be like, oh, I wish there was more like shoulder <laughs> volume or something in there. Yeah. It's like, bro, there is enough shoulder volume in there if you're doing the sets correctly. Like hundred percent, you don't need to be doing lateral raises like six times a week or like, <laughs> dumbbell lateral raises and cable lateral raises and machine it's like yeah like you know what you don't have to do it that much to mm. get absolutely huge lateral 100%. delt heads like it's same with arms like i'll train arms in like a lower sort of volume maybe twice a week and like you will make so much more progress if the if the volume you're you know committing is actually mm. intentional yeah um, and that's the thing like when you're onto your 10th exercise in your chest day you're not getting much out of it you're exactly. just going to be mentally fatigued Whereas like my typical upper body day, you'll start with a primary compound, then you'll go to like weighted chins or something like that, then maybe a close grip bench press. There'll be like five or six exercises in there and to like Athlean X or something like that, they might think, oh, it's not enough volume or I don't know, your typical gym bro uh, bro split, like they're not enough volume, but trust me, like I've made a whole lot more progress doing less, but actually more intentional and more intensely. Yeah, in, in this case, less is more for mm -hmm. sure. So long as you're doing it to like high quality and really intense, so 100% right, yeah. And that feeds into our next point, obviously the recovery side of things. So there's all the optimized stimulus through your training structure and everything like that. But obviously the second half of that is the recovery. Yeah, so with recovery, um, sleep, you can't skimp out on this. Like if you might be able to get away with it for the uh, moderate short term, so like the first year or two, um, but when you start to funnel into more elite or performance-based training or really just try to push the boundaries of your physique and strength, um, sleep is a cornerstone that you can't miss. So eight hours plus for performance-related um, trainees is, is essential. Like you can't skimp out of that. Uh, it goes hand-in-hand -hand with nutrition. Uh, so if you're just starting out and granted you're not too overweight or that's a goal that's necessary to trim back weight, um, I'd suggest don't enter any sort of cut prematurely or don't skimp out on uh, any sort of food that is going to assist your strength and um, size. You can put on a lot of lean mass uh, for like a decent while without accumulating too much fat mass. If you start from that kind of smaller, skinny, semi-athletic, uh, really lean type of physique mm -hmm. that a lot of guys uh, might be starting out with. So yeah. That's um yeah a really good point because there are so many guys out there who are like, oh, I want to get shredded for summer and they go and cut you know, your calorie deficit and they look like shit because they don't have any muscle mass to begin with. It's like, you need to actually spend time going that muscle mass. And like, that's what I did in the first bit of my training when I was doing my bro split, I'd literally be on like keto, like shredding, like starving my body. And I thought I was huge. I wasn't, I was about 67 kilos. Um, you know, I had like pretty ripped abs and stuff like that. But once I entered a lean bulk and I would just, every single day I would be hitting 3,200 um, calories I uh, went so over with my protein I'd have like 240 grams a day but I think that's one thing you need to learn <laughs> um, but it, it bloody paid off and my body absolutely exploded like literally I remember I got back from a festival in 20, start of 2019 and I just went lean bulk and that was the same year of exchange I went from 68 kilos to 85 Fuck. and gained like very minimal fat mm. and it was just like my body exploded and by the time I got home from exchange and my friends thought I did drugs in Malaysia because <laughs> like my legs had turned into tree trunks and I was just like having it's chicken nutty. and rice seven times a day there yeah. for dessert as well came back built different it's like you act you mate you need to eat like give the body the fuel you need i suppose there's different body types and people respond differently but i think you're you'd be pretty similar to me like your body just responds well to the right nutrients yeah yeah so responding to the right nutrients is essentially just eating enough mm. and so like some general kind of guides that might be good are Again, if you're focusing on performance, which, you know, listen to this, you probably are, 
um, protein intake, not skimping out of that is essential. So um, two grams of protein roughly per kilo of body weight is probably the kind of baseline you want to do. Um, like you said, you had heaps of meals. Maybe you don't need to do seven. You can do it if you're really dedicated and you've got the ability to, but at least kind of three to four times a day, you want to be spreading those mm. meals. Um, optimal protein intake, there's a lot of uh, rabbit hole we can go down to that, but yeah, optimal uh, protein and then spreading it over the day. Then you go into your carbs, making sure there's enough carbs to fill your sesh. Um, just a point out, it might be good is the higher amount of carbs uh, meals per day you want to have pre and post sesh. And then you can kind of uh, flatten out onto the um, before and after. But yeah. I remember I made a video about a year ago, just like showing kids how to cook like your chicken and steak on the barbecue and things like that. And I was like, you know, you want to aim for around two to 2.4 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. And I had all these people coming at me going like, that is way too much. That is so unhealthy. Like you should be aiming for like 0.8 to to (laughs) one. I'm like, Karen, excuse me. (laughs) Like get off this video. You will make absolutely no progress if you're if that's like your threshold. Yeah, uh, I reckon. Yeah, they're right. If all you're doing is jumping out of bed straight on the computer or the couch for twelve hours a day and then going back to sleep, but yeah, if you're doing any sort of meaningful exercise, especially if you want to put on muscle tissue, it's nowhere near enough. So yeah, and that two grams is kind of around the lower end as well, wouldn't it? Like- yeah, there's there's um, there's people and studies that say um, that higher end, so like the high twos, even branching onto three, because not all protein sources yeah. are equal. Some are That's like true. less uh, and more useful than others, especially if you're getting a diverse diet where you can't afford to get high quality uh, meats or protein sources every mm-hmm. single time you eat protein. Even going yeah, in that mid to high two is uh, not going to hurt if you've got the calories to spare. Yeah, I think my I'm around 81 kilos at the moment and my coach is prescribed me with 167 grams a day, which I was like, dude, that's a bit low. I'm going to dwindle away. But he's like, no, when you're in a slight surplus, like it's actually not as important to have that high protein mm. intake. That's and, true, yeah. Uh, you'll probably have, uh, what's it called? Digestion issues if you're going overboard with the protein and things mm. like that. So I'm 81 kilos two grams per kilo of body weight for me would be 162 grams of protein. So 167 is kind of around that figure. What are, what are you kind of aiming for? At the um, so I'm actually in the middle of a cut to get to back 96, 97 for mm. the purpose of weight classes. Um, but I'm 98 right now. Not too long ago, I was 103. Um, that was a bit of COVID weight, but um, I'm dabbling in the 200 minimum to as high as maybe 240 per day on like a really intense yeah. training day, especially if I've got the meals to fit in. And yeah. I suppose obviously when you're cutting, the protein intake is more imperative because that, you want right. to retain as much of that muscle tissue as yeah, you can. Yeah, going from a surplus or a maintenance into a cut, you may even ramp up the protein as you decrease the carbohydrates and fat. So yeah, you're right, higher yeah. protein. In the One of the topics I have a lot of, you know, I just can't stand is when people just stand there and argue to me, no, you can have as much protein as you want in one sitting and your body will still utilize it. I don't know how much truth there is behind it, but I was on a a podcast with the Strength Culture boys who are pretty bloody smart and they were like, it's one of the lowest hanging fruits you can grab is if you're having 30 to 50 grams of protein per sitting and you're spreading it over three to four times a day. Would that is that something you agree with? Or? Yeah, yeah, totally agree. So basically, um, you can't just buy a whole chicken, eat in one sitting, and think you're going to make the same gains versus splitting it up all through the day. Your body just uh, via a certain uh, number of factors has an ability only to be able to synthesize so much protein uh, per uh, bout of time. Uh, so yeah, splitting up is essential. You definitely don't want to be doing these crazy just one meal or two meal a day sort of things. You're really, really hindering your progress. Again, low hanging fruit. You want to be splitting up multiple times a day. Mm-hmm. The lowest hanging fruits for sure. Um, obviously, you want a, a full amino acid spectrum when you're having your your protein intake. That's why certain vegan proteins cop quite a bit of criticism. Is because you know if you're only having soy protein you're only having pea protein or only brown rice it doesn't have a complete amino acid spectrum which i think affects things like absorption and muscle Mm. protein synthesis so definitely the quality of the protein matters but i'm not too researched on the technicalities of that but yeah yep yeah so yeah like you said if you um, aren't vegan or i'm vegetarian you've got the luxury of being able to buy and consume meats and dairy products and like eggs and stuff uh, a, div- a diverse range of protein sources probably uh, your best bet um, and then if you want to get even more specific to amplify your performance uh, whey protein around the workout window is a very good source of protein for just for the quickness of its digestion uh, and then something like casein before bed for slow mm-hmm. digestion when you don't have uh, the ability to eat 
uh, of that course of time where you're sleeping. So yeah, some extra kind of points. Now, finally, on your trajectory to get really strong, we talk about the importance of carbs and consequently, keto is absolutely horrible if you're wanting to get stronger. Now, let's just touch on the importance of carbs here. Yep, so carbs are essentially like your baseline uh, fuel for any sort of uh, exercise that is like moderately or more high intensity. Uh, and that isn't like too aerobic, but even for aerobic training, you definitely need carbs. Um, so to skimp out on carbs is basically to throw away potential kilos on your lifts or just go backwards if you're going from carbs to no carbs. So definitely um, don't get sucked into the whole um, cliche or, or like fad of, of low carb or keto. It's not at all uh, good for performance. It'll only decrease your performance, yeah. Yeah, it's like, I don't know, when you're powerlifting, you do at least from with my coach we focus on a pretty high carb intake mm. every day i think it's like 50 to 55 percent of my macros are going to be like pretty complex carbs building up those glycogen stores mm. and like if i don't have my carbs i can feel it like exactly yeah so carbohydrates that's the first kind of fuel your body resource mm. to when it's doing high intensity activity uh, and it's the, the easiest to digest and be able to use for fuel so um, if you're purposely taking them out so that you can use fats it's actually much less efficient mm -hmm. uh, in terms of just the energy uh, usage for the workout but then you've like you said the topping up the glycogen stores that's a very very big part of powerlifting optimizing your leverages by filling out your muscles making sure that you're well hydrated with the um, glycogen stores fully topped out your muscles are really voluminous your leverages are, are mm -hmm. optimized if you take that away and become string cheese and just really flat and and all that you're just going to have a really bad time trying to lift heavy especially if you were eating carbs and then you go to take them away guarantee your lifts are just going to plummet especially if you're a natural lifter i yeah. think keto has a place and that's probably if you're obese or extremely overweight and you need to cut a lot of fat very quickly i think it can be a really good way to stick to a calorie deficit um and like it like it, it does have its place if you're trying to lose weight rapidly but if you're a performance athlete i think keto is one of the most destructive things you could kind of indulge into yeah, 100%. Um, and like we talk about nutrient timing, there's definitely certain times when carbs are most important to supplement with. I think obviously before you work out your pre-workout meal, which is going to, you should be having probably an hour before you work out, that's going to be like a primary fuel source for your workout. So that should be pretty heavy in carbs as well. Mm. Yeah, look, yeah, like pre-workout, high carbs, uh, and probably uh, side tip, moderate to low fat to yeah. um, not interfere with the carbohydrate uptake post-workout you can afford maybe some higher gi carbs uh, i personally sometimes have cereal after workout it's just really easy to get down your body's yearning for that um uh, restock of energy also a cheeky tip pre-workout you might want to if you ever order sushi get those leftover fish just squeeze them in your mouth uh, plenty of those pre-workout coupled with a lot of water is again going to optimize your leverages make you really swole fill up your muscles with water which is what you want for a big heavy sesh so don't skimp out on the sodium pre-workout yeah the, so water. the sodium is so slept on like pink himalayan rock salt soy sauce like those little fishes are so yep. delicious and that'll give you the most hectic pump i reckon yeah yeah huge huge major key there now finally once you've got super strong how do you get into powerlifting? Like, what is your number one tip for any of those 16-year-old guys out there or girls wanting to get into it? Like, what's your best tips for getting into it? Um, I'd say uh, what you want to do is, if granted you're like a drug-tested powerlifter, you don't, don't intend to get on steroids or anything, which is probably the vast majority of people, I'd say, the, the, again, like we talked about, the main federation there is right now is Australian Powerlifting Union. Um, so if you're watching this video and you're looking to get into it from there, look up that website. It's APU Powerlifting. Uh, bring it to the website. Um, I'm not, not sure for them or anything. This is just the easiest way to get into it. Um, look at the registration and how they work, the about and all the general info. Find out what you need to do uh, and then uh, go on the events calendar. There'll be a bunch of comps you can do or hopefully this yeah. year that'll come out um, and then just kind of see one that's in your um, state, get ready for it. And then if you want to get ready via getting a coach or getting a program, you can do whatever you need. But getting that first initial comp is uh, very essential and it's something that a lot of people are scared to do, but don't be scared. You're going to have, if you're planning to get in powerlifting long-term, you're obviously going to do many, many comps. So just getting your foot in the door, jump to the website, see how it works. Uh, sign up for a comp and just take it from there and there is a little bit of drama happening with comps this year we won't touch on the politics side too much but can't even do it um, yeah you, <laughs> at the moment we need more comps but hopefully like I presume they'll come the demand's there yeah, I think hopefully, hopefully they yeah, will sort their stuff out and get some more comps out so people can lift some weights yeah 
Now, the second major topic we want to touch on, Matt, would you consider yourself a bench press specialist? Uh, well, yeah, by by kind of accident. Actually, in 2018, I had a, a knee surgery to mm. get like a little bony cyst taken out from underneath my patella tendon, which was causing a lot of inflammation. So because of that, leading into the knee surgery, I lost a lot of leg progress for about a year. And it's after that surgery, I lost about another year trying to recoup my strength. Mm -hmm. But in that meantime, I was still bench pressing. So when my lower body lift started to go down and had to recover, I was able to still bench press, whether it be my leg on a block or whatever, I was bench pressing through the recovery. So it just kept shooting up. So um, a little bit of history in 2017, when I started, I was 17 turning 18 in the sub junior division, which is under 18, actually broke the national record of 170 kilos in the 93 kilogram Jeez. class weight, just turned 18. Uh, so that was kind of, I guess my bench was already a standout. And then when those lower body lifts couldn't keep up, my bench kept going up. Yep. Um, the last, my best in comp is 186, but the best in terms of body weight in comp would be 185 weighing just shy of 90 kilos. So over two times body weight. Jeez. Yeah. I've, I think I've seen you hit more than that in the gym though, not comp, right? Yeah, I'm still, I haven't done a comp in a while. So my PBs are actually 195, weighing uh, about 97, 98. Mm -hmm. um, I've been meaning to hit the, the Fable 200, just haven't got around to that for, to put it simply, haven't got around to testing it out. I've got a cup coming up in Feb and then hopefully one in May. So it'd be nice to crack down that barrier just to solidify. I know I've got the strength for it, but um, like see me lift in, in person, it's, I've hit 190, 195 really easily. Just haven't got around to loading up the 200 yet. And guys, if you haven't seen Matt bench press, it is an absolute sight to behold. So go look up his Instagram. I think it's just Matt Crundle Correct, on Instagram. Yeah. He's got videos of him bench pressing there. It is insane, like seriously inspirational. So go have a look at that. Appreciate it. And the thing is, a comp bench press is so different to like your average gym bro. You see on TikTok bench, what the same way. Like you, one, you have the pressure of comp. Yeah. Two, you've got three judges like looking at everything. If your ass comes off one millimeter, if I remember my heels were off by like a millimeter in comp and like it didn't count. Yeah. Uh, like there are so many factors that go into it. Your pause like can vary based on the judge you have. There is a lot of pressure there. Mm. Um, and not to mention it's different to a touch and go bench press at a commercial gym or something like that. Like it, it is, I'd say probably 20% harder as a comp bench press or yeah. something like that. You'd be right. Something in the, the manner of like 20, 10 to 20%. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Depending on. Especially like, I'm just talking pauses as well. Like the pause adds a whole nother level to it. Before I started powerlifting, I was just touch and go bench yep. pressing. Look how much I can do. But that's kind of where we'll start on this bench press guide. So there's a difference between pause, bench press and touch and go. I'd say kind of the rule book is if you wanted to get into powerlifting, you need to get used to that pause on your chest. So just at the bottom of the range of motion, the barbell comes to a standstill, it can't be moving and mm. then you press it back up versus touch and go where you're just repping it out, classic gym bro, something like that. Yep. So if you're looking to get into powerlifting, get used ASAP to pausing. And especially if you are slamming the bar off your chest and trying to fracture your ribs, stop that ASAP. If you're looking to do a powerlifting comp anytime soon, it's going to be a whole lot harder to pause. So uh, like you said, the bar in a competition has to come to a stop. So uh, it doesn't matter how fast you get to your chest, it has to stop before the ref is going to say, press so if you're doing any sort of touch and go you're likely not used to that um stability factor of having to rest the bar and freeze it on your chest mm -hmm. so yeah start doing that asap especially if you're slamming it off your chest it's, it's going to be no help at all for powerlifting no uh, that just like reminds me how many technicalities there actually are to a comp bench press like your yeah, elbows have to be somewhat locked out like yep. your grip can't be too wide mm. your head has to be in contact your glutes and your heels have to be in contact um yeah as you said as fast as you want but if you do it too fast you won't have control of it yep. and you have to wait for their calls as well i think the first call is press oh no sorry what, what's the first one it's so um, you've got one you take when you take the bar out of the rack it's start you bring start, it down yep. your chest press take it off your chest and then rack, rack yeah so yeah can, it, when you got a lot of adrenaline thrown for your body uh, it's really can be really tough for some people to hone in listen to a ref saying these words when they've they're in autopilot just lifting the bar so yeah get used to um the calls and so, that sure. rack call that is a killer it's like oh Fuck yeah. yeah i've done the rep and yeah. then you forget you rush the rack yeah. call and you lift up i've had i've had a couple of lifters at comps uh sacrifice an attempt just because they racked it like one millisecond too early mm. these refs are no joke so yeah you compete, it's really strict. I reckon the rack call is hardest in a squat because yeah. like when you've finished a hard squat, the first thing you want to do is rack it. Yeah, so get you that bar in, off my back. You just need to actually wait there and wait for the call. I remember 
in the warm ups with Josh at my comp, I kept rushing the rap call. And so I just like made sure I need to do it. So there's yeah. a lot of technicalities that go into it. Yeah. And there's that press command. Your press command can like vary so much on the judging. Yeah, hand. I actually, um, I, for before I broke the, the highest national record, I uh, had another comp. I was aiming for the national record. Missed it because I pressed off the chest like one millisecond too early. And these refs are no joke. Mm. They didn't take, uh, they didn't have a bar of it. They just put nah, red lights and I was like gutted. So yeah. I remember in, in my first and only comp I did, um, I wasn't happy with one of the calls I got. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I didn't know who the head judge was. And I then later found out it's a guy called JP, who's a very... Oh, um, yeah, JP. Who's a very prominent and yep. renowned power of doing Australia. <laughs> so I was like, mate, are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> and Josh was like, go get the fuck off the Oh, platform. lucky, <laughs> lucky. I was like, my heel was like apparently yeah. a millimeter off the ground. I don't know how he saw it. That's tough, man, yeah. Um, but yeah, they, they could like, you can get a loose judge you sometimes. You can get shafted, man, yeah, if you're not or ready. Or you can get absolutely shafted. Yep. So yeah, get used to that powerlifting technique. Um, and the next thing is controversial, but also extremely necessary if you're wanting to lift the most amount of weight possible, and it's the arch. Yeah, so, okay, so we're splitting bench press up. If you're just doing performance, hypertrophy, whatever, a little bit of scapular traction, opening the chest up, make sure your shoulders are stable. That's probably enough if you want a large range of uh, motion for your chest. If you want to maximize the amount of kilos you can lift, then getting used to that um, uncomfortable arch is quintessential. Um, the arch isn't something you're born with and people can do a massive arch and this guy can only bench with a flat back. Nah, it's just getting used to the arch, drilling it in, spending lots of sets and sessions, coiling your body up. Think of a ruler from both ends. You push it with your hands and it bows. That's basically what the arch is. So the arch is all in your back, uh, ideally in your upper back, so thoracic um, area, but getting used to that uncomfortable arch is good. Again, like you said, it's controversial. If you do what he said and look up my IG, you will see that I have a pretty big arch. Um, uh, if you're not used to this, you might think I'm getting uh, exercised by like a priest or something. Uh, but no, nah, it's, it's essential to get used to. I don't think people understand how much of a skill the arch is, particularly for a male, because uh, typically a female is going to be much more flexible mm. than a male is. Whereas us blokes are pretty inflexible. We don't do much stretching. Like Matt here wood. Is, yeah, literally. So for a male to have a good arch, it is seriously impressive. I think I've got decent flexibility for a guy. But it's gotten better this year. Yeah, definitely. For sure. Um, it's nowhere near like the best arches you've seen. Matt's is incredible. Um, and it's actually a skill to get that kind of... Like the bench press is an art form, I feel. It's not just your average bro exercise like getting that arch is i don't know it, it makes or break, breaks your bench press yep 100 percent. so yeah getting used to that arch um i'd say just you know look at those um powerlifters on instagram and stuff the ones who have like really kind of phenomenal bench presses really solid looking setups even if you don't know much about how to go about the arch and the sort of region that you're meant to extend in your back and the sort of muscular chats meant to contract um, just look at those successful bench presses. You, if you're looking at my page, kind of look how I arch, look where I position the feet and just practice it when you're doing your own bench sessions tied into getting used to pausing and you'll actually be surprised how um, much you can arch and get stable. Now, it's funny because when I think of the best bench presses, I think of John Hack. Now, John Hack has no arch or like he, he definitely does retract his scapula, but like he's got one of the flattest backs you've seen. Yeah, well, there's there's... The, the tenet that we're looking for is that retracted scapula with a bit of uh, depression, which means kind of just putting shoulder blades down and back and down, uh, really tight, locked in back, uh, traps, uh, lats, all bunched up. The range of motion um, differs a lot depending on your arm length, your ability to pull your shoulders back behind you and, and how big your arch is. So as long as you have that stability in an arch, um, your bench press can be really strong without uh, much range of motion can be really strong with a lot of range of motion. Like you're talking about John Hack, um, huge bench press. He still um, has a pretty good arch, Has still has tilts his rib, rib cage yeah. up to the sky. I suppose it's just like not that visible like the Sydney Harbour Bridge type. Yeah. Like more, <laughs> yeah. I think it's very honest bench probably press. Probably more or less similar to my arch kind of thing. I think mine's probably yeah. slightly bigger, but yeah. yeah. Just, and yeah, don't, don't get swept into the whole max grip, um, make the range of motion as tiny as possible on your, on your day one of power. I think cause it's, it's romanticized by all these kind of, uh, USA lifters or whatever. Yeah. Um, try the arch, get used to it. Your range of motion is still going to be pretty big. So don't think you're cheating and all that. Like I remember when I was in high school, um, I benched 145 with pretty much a flat back, um, when I was like 16 or 15 or 16. Um, and 
I barely had an arch at all, but because I was not used to it, no one at school like knew what arching was. I was scared to post it because I thought people would say I'm cheating, just having, having that minor curvature in my back. Yeah. Don't be scared at all. It's going to save your shoulders. Make sure you um, stave away from injuries. So yeah. Honestly, the people who criticize arches just seriously don't know what they're talking about and would have a severely inferior bench most yeah. of the time. Like it's gen- generally <clears throat> just people who don't know what they're talking about because it oh, 100%. is a serious skill. Now, I'm trying to think if there are any other really good bench presses that I can think of. Like Taylor Atwood has one of yep. the best benches for such a light. And he, he's got like a pretty similar arch to mine, but it's not mm. that huge. He's yeah. just got his technique absolutely down pat. Yeah, I think part of it is these guys have a really solid and stable arch. However, their arms just aren't that seemingly short. So mm. the range the range of motion is still actually going to be pretty decent. Yeah. Um, what we talked about before with just general training principles and getting stronger is you want to employ good technique wherever it ends you up at. So small range of motion, large range of motion, good technique, meaning solid back stability, um, tight, tight back as well, really stable on the bench. However long your range of motion is, apply it over lots of sessions. We're talking years and you're going to end up with a big bench press no matter what. Yeah, I think John Hack just did like 270 kilos in companies like 90 kilos body weight. I think, I don't know if he's on gear though. I think Yeah, drugs play a part. Like he, yeah. he benched about 210, 215 as a nanny, which is still um, yeah. astronomical to do in the 80 body weight range. Yeah. But yeah, we're, we're talking drugs that does amplify you a bit. Yeah, it's a lot. still seriously impressive. Um, Huge. Now we've got different ideal grips. What do you, we want to touch on on that? Um, yeah, so grips, it's all dependent on your preference, really, what feels best. So your anthropometry, which is basically the, the structure and length of your bones in your body, um, that'll be the first biggest factor that determines what's going to feel comfortable. If you've got really long arms, uh, you're going to have a lot of horizontal shoulder abduction. Um, Basically, you probably want to go as wide as possible. If you've got shorter, stockier arms, and which probably goes hand in hand with having really beefy um, triceps, you might actually feel stronger with the close grip. The triceps and anterior deltoids moving in such a way that they take uh, precedence over the chest or, or alongside the chest. Um, yeah, so my advice would be experiment different grips, give a few sets to each, and really be attentive of what actually feels the best to you. Mm-hmm. Don't listen to some guy saying, this is the textbook technique. If you don't bench like this, you're losing kilos. Don't don't be scared. Experiment different techniques and whatever feels the best is probably going to work for you. I don't have that wide of a grip. Yeah. Um, I've got pinkies on the rings when you can actually go up to index fingers on the rings. So um, that works best for me. I've got big tries, big um, uh, shoulders and, and back. So that works for me. Yeah, I think I'm kind of, I don't go index fingers on the rings. I'm kind of like probably the middle finger on yeah. the rings i'd say that's where i'm about so i've got a kind of a wider grip than yours but it's still not max grip mm. now we'll go into the equipment there's mm. different sorts of equipment that you're allowed at least in our federation you're allowed wrist wraps you're allowed to bench with a belt which is kind of uncommon uh you're allowed your lifting shoes anything else obviously your <coughs> soft suit uh, i think that's i think that's everything yeah pretty much uh everything there so the equipment wrist wraps um, if you haven't got a pair, I'd say get one and wear it for most of your sets and then compare it to what it feels like without wrist wraps. The vast majority of people will probably feel better and stronger with wrist wraps. There are a small portion that don't, but wrist wraps are probably essential. Like everyone in comp is wearing wrist wraps essentially. And is that just like wrist stability or? Um, yeah. So when your wrist goes back into extension, it's just easier to keep it locked and kind of almost fused in that uh, point. If it's subject to any sort of movement or instability, it's like taking a belt away from your squat, mm. but for your wrist, essentially, if you don't have it there. Yeah. I remember when I first started integrating wrist wraps, it felt so weird for me. And I think it actually detracted from my bench, but once I got used to it, it definitely aided in that wrist stability. And mm. like, uh, if I'm doing a heavier weight, I just couldn't bench without it essentially. Likewise. Um, now benching with a belt, what's your opinion on that? Benching with a belt. So using a belt, uh, for, especially if you're on the lighter side or not like a heavy dude. So if you're like under hundred kilos and you're not too short, so you've got like mass, but you're kind of, uh, flexible enough to arch, I'd say give it a shot. See if it feels good. Same with the grip. You want to dabble in things, see if it feels better, but what it's going to do is likely detract from your ability to actually arch. It's actually going to physically get in the way mm-hmm. of getting that back arch. So when you get more advanced and you're able to arch more, it's probably going to actually take it away. So I'm not a big fan of benching with a belt unless you're kind of a obtuse sort of person or like you're, you're really big and you're a close grip bencher with mm-hmm. not much arch, then you might do it. But again, with the wrist straps, majority of people probably won't wear a belt. 
Now, the last one is like the shoes you can wear. So for me, I wear Nike Romalios, which have a pretty decent heel in it. Yep. I think you wear flat shoes when yep. you bench, don't you? Yeah, so I actually used to wear Nike uh, Romalios as well. I actually bought, um, unfortunately, a limited edition pair, which I was like really happy about copying. And then I found out that I felt better in flats. So I haven't worn them since, unfortunately. Yep. But Nike Romalios, if you're a bench presser who has your feet, which would talk about next leg drive and stuff but if you have your feet further back and closer to your body um, it's easier to actually set your arch up because that heel is artificially still uh, in contact with the ground even though your foot's in an angle which means you can push your feet further back grant a bit of extra ankle mobility so it helps actually get an arch if you're a more passive and kind of um, set up person that way with your heels back uh, flats i'd actually recommend them if you're a bencher who has your shins um, perpendic uh, perpendicular to the ground or uh, at a positive angle. So you're pushing kind of away from the floor into the bench. Mm -hmm. uh, that ties into, again, leg drive. Uh, that's much more active. That's where your quads are engaged the whole time. Easier to have stability in the ground with a flat shoe. So they both serve a purpose. So this isn't like wrist wraps and belt one or the other. Um, this is comfort and what feels best for you. So it's going to differ. Now you squat in flats as well, don't you? I uh, squat in a small heel. So I've got a different yeah. shoe. So I've got an Adidas power lift, which is... A, Basically, the heel height is in between your Romalio and the yeah. flat shoe. So yeah, that's yeah. just personal preference for me. And I'm pretty sure the Reeboks are like the max heel, aren't they? Um, yeah, those are probably too big for most yeah. people. I'd say with your with your squat, I mean, we'll touch on squat really uh, shortly here, but um, you want to experiment with, first of all, a flat shoe uh, that's stable, so nice and flat and actually flat to the ground, not like a, your ASICS runners or whatever. Um, and then... Um, you can dabble in heels if you want and, and really compare with solid technique what feels the best. A lot of people will go flats, a lot of people will go heels and a lot of people will go high heels. It's just a really diverse range. So a lot of people are going to feel uh, different. Some people, or actually a lot of people bench and squat in the notorious lifts. Mm. I can't stand it. I, <clears throat> I, I Deadlifting feels great in them. Yeah. I can't stand it for squats and what's bench. Uh, what's the turn off? Um, I feel like it kind of rolls on the sides. Mm. And for me, I feel like I'm going to roll an ankle, particularly yeah. when I squat. Like it doesn't feel good. Yeah. Um, personally, for me, I've got these, I don't think you can get them anymore. These, they're called Reebok Power Light TRs. Um, got a, um, they're a high top shoe. They look like Converse, but they've got a really, really good flat base with like all these rubber suction caps almost. And you tie them really tight. You've got really good ankle stability. So I'm a, I'm a big advocate of um, high tops with good quality ankle stability for your squat when your, your shin kind of rolls around side to side or your bench uh, and deadlift and stuff. So I use those. Yeah, and guys, shoes make a huge difference. If you're still deadlifting in a pair of Nike runners, check yourself out because that is just... Like if I see someone doing that, like... Cringe. It, you know, like and nothing Squirm. against you. It's just like... Take, at least take your shoes off. Yeah, like that please, is the next please. upgrade you can make and then invest into a pair your of Your lift will shoot up immediately. Like Flat that, shoe, it's going to shoot up immediately. That spongy sole, think about it, the force you're exerting into the ground, it's just literally getting lost in translation. Like you're not getting anything out of it. Yep. It's so spongy. Exactly, exactly. Um, but being able to apply force into the ground directly, whether it be a heel or a flat shoe, is uh, essential for lifting. So mm -hmm. take away those like bulky, squishy runners or whatever you have socks for starters or your connies or um, vans and then dabble in the powerlifting shoes now the last thing we'll touch on for the ultimate bench press guide here is your leg drive slash foot placement mm, okay so this one is very very um, intricate and different for everybody depending on your body type so we'll talk about the anth anthropometry so basically your bones how they're structured the um, mobility for them to move within the socket um, if you have kind of shorter legs this is what I've experienced you have shorter legs uh, and they're also mobile so you've got mobile hips you uh, might have a good time with benching far back I know you, you bench with your heels back and it, it probably mm -hmm. feels quite stable for you so yeah. benching far back you might want to chuck heels on uh, feet close to your hips you get a really big arch without even having to try that hard because you just wedge yourself into this position yeah. you don't really have to actively apply uh, leg drive might be a bit less stable because you're not able to use your quads but really good way to get your arch set up uh, and without having to try that much so just contort yourself naturally yeah. um, the other two would be kind of 
um, shin perpendicular. So basically your legs at 90 degrees to the ground. Um, probably a flat shoe would work best for this. This is just kind of your 50-50 um, build. So if you've got moderate size legs uh, lengthwise and your, your torso is not too long or too short, it's probably going to be your like even build. You're able to produce uh, force in the ground to get a big arch, but you're also pretty stable uh, as a result of having a bit of control, but also not having to actively press too hard on the ground. Then your other end of the spectrum is your feet in front of you, which you see some of those really, really contortionist sort of arch people do mm. they have their feet way in front they press horizontally in the floor really hard so they're pressing through the ball of their foot their heel really hard using their quad and basically they squish their whole body coil it up uh, like a spring all up at their upper back uh, they've got you know kind of a neutral sort of pelvis there's not much arch in the lumbar but basically their chest is squished against their neck because of how much force they're yep. applying so again like with the aforementioned topics um this is going to be dependent on what feels best for you. So you bench this way because it feels good. I bench with uh, flat shoes and kind of um, perpendicular shin because it feels good for me. It's yep. going to completely depend on your uh, individual preference. So guys, get out there, experiment, take these tips on board and find what works for you and kind of run with that technique. Once you run with that technique, you can start developing, is it called like really efficient motor patterns and things like that? Or Yeah. So as you talked about before, when you get to a certain size, especially if you're just maintaining body weight and you're not actively putting on tons of muscle um, that technical acquisition and like that neurological adaptation to like a certain motor pattern is what's going to cause the um, the longevity mm. um, strength gains so the strength gains you make from your body firing those um, motor units more efficiently yep. in a certain pattern so dabble find what works best for you and if you ha if you happen to find a, a fit you know in the first month or few weeks of lifting um roll with that and just practice 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 technique you're going to shoot up in strength just because of getting good technique yeah fantastic well mate in 51 episodes i think this is probably our most technical podcast we've really dived quite deep into the technicalities of strength and the bench press particularly matt if people want to find you where can they find you so i uh, do most of my stuff on instagram so that's just matt at matt crundle uh, and then you can inquire there for coaching and, and via DM and stuff. Uh, also, uh, I coach at a training day gym in Clayton. So if you have a roll up there, I'm likely there. You can book in a consult with me, uh, do the PT side of things. But for powerlifting coaching, that's online. So you can contact me via Instagram. Yep. Do you have many spaces open at the moment? I know you're a very popular coach. Uh, yeah, so in person, not so much, uh, but online, definitely a, a lot of spaces. I've got about 25, 30 uh, roster powerlifters at the moment that are competing this year will probably have maybe another 15 to 20 I'm um, happy to take on uh, this year as well fantastic thanks so much guys for listening if you do want to support us please leave us a review on Spotify you can leave a review on Spotify now I think we got over 300 which is impo which is incredible and we're constantly charting so you guys are just supporting it really well uh, you can leave us a review on apple as well drop a comment on youtube drop a like on youtube if you want to support us in a monetary way you can pick us pick up some apparel we got these sweet singlets here um, we've also got programs my new power building program is out uh, use code ntf for supplements as well as any sponsors that were mentioned within the podcast too guys thank you so much for listening and i hope you got a lot out of this podcast cheers see ya